The deep, heartfelt rhythms of the Christian faith may be expressed in a variety of styles and voices as they emphasize different aspects of a common faith. Loud, triumphant anthems invoke God's greatness. Beloved hymns teach God's faithfulness and leading. Quiet, contemplative choruses recall God's love and mercy. Simplicity in a worship service invites intimacy and spontaneity. More formal worship services emphasize God's grandeur and order in the universe. The rhythms of worship, whether expressed through music or the work of God's people as His story is told and celebrated, is part of the ongoing story we know today as the history of Christian worship. Music has always been part of worship, beginning with the expressive and rich psalms of Old Testament Jewish worship and the hymns and spiritual songs sung by early Christian believers in the New Testament church. Worship expressed through music has grown to include a variety of voices and instruments, from single voice plain chant to choral arias, from the tambourine and harp to electric guitars and drums. As with most art forms, music and worship reflects the full range of human emotions and experiences, from sorrow to joy, from prayer to praise, from solemnity to exuberance. I believe it was Augustine who said that when we sing, we pray twice. And that's a very important concept. We pray twice. Uh, we we articulate to God with our words, with our feelings, and with our emotions, what it is that we've heard in the Bible, what it is we've read in the Bible, and we do that as one. The music is always serving a ministerial role in the worship. It's never standing as its own thing that draws us just into itself. Now, it does have to draw us. The music has to be engaging, appealing, appropriate. It has to be something the people in the pews understand and can sing. But we never stop at the music. The music is an avenue towards a deeper thing. The worship of God through music is often an intensely personal experience and different for every believer. I remember vividly long nights till one or two o'clock in the morning in darkened churches playing the organ and those have been some of the most profound spiritual experiences of intimacy with God that I've ever had. I would frequently sit and you know, play for hours, and I'd have tears streaming down my face. You know, it was just so moving to me. And it was because of what was happening through the music and, and my relationship with God. We know from the Bible that music has been a vital part of the church since its inception and will continue and endure even into the heavenly church as described in the book of Revelation. The New Testament mentions the singing of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs in diverse times and places. These songs were often sung in unison to reflect unity among believers and accompanied the sharing of a meal as part of worship. Early church fathers such as Tertullian and Clement of Alexandria of the second century and the writers of the Apostolic Constitutions in the late fourth century all confirm the singing of psalms and other hymns as a component of worship. Fourth century church historian Eusebius writes of worshipers often offering a sung response to a psalm or spoken text, which is referred to as an antiphon. What is missing in the music of the early church is any hint or mention of musical instruments being used in worship. Quite the opposite is true. Clement of Alexandria and later Chrysostom and Augustine all wrote of the lack of instruments in early worship, perhaps because instruments were used in the music of the heathen and pagan feasts and celebrations of the day. Eusebius, in his commentary on the Psalms, comments on the lack of musical instruments in worship a tradition that continues today in the Eastern Orthodox and other churches. The unison voices of Christians would be more acceptable to God than any musical instrument. 
accordingly in all the churches of God, united in soul and attitude, with one mind and an agreement of faith piety, we send up a unison melody in the words of the Psalms. Eusebius, Commentary on Psalm 91, verses 2 and 3. By the early Middle Ages, the use of psalms in worship was adapted by monks and priests into a style of music known as plain song. Plain song is the the song has been called the song of the church. It's the way the church has has sung in various localities for for uh, thousands of years. May even go back to uh, to Jewish worship. We don't know for sure because there, there's not a direct lineage back to Jewish worship. Um, but there, it's we, we know it's very very ancient. It, it goes back at least to the time of of Gregory the Great, and probably before his time because Gregory the Great codified. Gregorian chant, but the chant existed before him. Plain song and Gregorian chant are monophonic forms of music, which means there is a single line of melody, often sung without accompaniment, in a free rhythm rather than a strict mathematical timing. The style strips the music to its barest elements and allows for greater concentration on the text itself. People can learn older forms like chant and so at my church, we do use some Gregorian chant in order to sing the Psalms. We use Gregorian chant, or even earlier forms of chant, uh, a chant setting of the Lord's Prayer, which we sing together each week, because those can be simple, memorable, and when everybody is actually on the same note, not singing harmony for a change, it actually is a wonderful unifying experience. In the medieval church, uh, we have a remarkable repertoire of music that developed. Um, often it was sung by um, uh, a group of singers called the Schola Cantorum, uh, a company of singers who would, um, along with the presiding clergy and priest, assist in the unfolding liturgy of the day. Um, it was practiced, uh, this plain chant, both in parish churches as well as in monasteries, though some differences emerged in these different contexts. But much of the music that we uh, have record of was um, music with one simple melody, monophonic music. It would be sung typically in unison. I think, though, we all know that uh, outside of a studio recording, there is no perfect unison. There are always the the different human voices coming together to sing uh, an unfolding melody. But then, um, over the course of especially the late Middle Ages, um, increasing complexity emerged with that music. So, um, uh, at one point in the uh, development of the music, um, a very simple rudimentary harmony would be sung, where uh, two voices or two sets of notes would be sung that moved in a parallel uh, uh, nature this shift in sacred music from a single voice to multiple voices singing in harmony also inspired the writing of masses and requiems to highlight the newfound range of choral singing. By the late 12th century, the use of organ music emerged as a method of accompaniment, and it was these grand sweeping styles of music that moved the church forward to the Reformation, where legendary figures such as Martin Luther and John Calvin would introduce hymns into the liturgy and life of the church. Certainly the, uh, the Reformation hymns are very important to me, and so we would start with something like A Mighty Fortress. Um, you think about how penetrated with Scripture those lyrics are. Now that's something that a congregation can sing, certainly, and a congregation should and does, and, and they do sing that. Um, but I just, I, I, I love the sturdiness of Luther's tune. Um, so many of our hymns have essentially weak tunes that are chromatic and not based on sort of the fundamentals of the scale. Luther had a real good sense there. But he also then took scripture and, in this case, Psalm 46, and recast it in Christian terms, recast it in terms that uh, could be remembered because there was meter and there was rhyme uh, and, uh, and rhythm and those kinds of elements which, which help people to take things that otherwise uh, the, they might read and lose and commit them to memory, make them part of their, their experience.
The 18th century marked great advancement in the music of the church on many levels. In Europe, composer Johann Sebastian Bach, sometimes called the fifth evangelist for his gift of sacred music, gave the world many grand organ and choral works. His famous Mass in B minor was said to have been the supreme cultural achievement of all Western civilization. Equally devoted in his passion for church music was George Frederick Kendall, whose oratorio, The Messiah, became one of the most popular sacred choral works, still performed by orchestras and choirs around the world. Likewise, the rise of hymn writing transformed the English church. Isaac Watts, the father of this movement, expanded upon the earlier works of John Calvin in adapting the psalms for congregational singing. His Hymns and Spiritual Songs was released in 1707, which contained the timeless hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Watts may have pioneered modern English hymnody, but it was the Wesley brothers, John and Charles, who spread the movement abroad with a new Protestant denomination known as Methodism. Charles Wesley wrote the soundtrack for this new religious movement, contributing volumes of stirring hymns, close to 9,000 total, that are still sung in churches today. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Christ the Lord is risen today. Jesus, lover of my soul. Love divine, all loves excelling, to cite just a few. These hymns expanded to the revival movements of the American frontier and have endured to the present for their emotional connection with worshipers of many Christian denominations. I found it very interesting over the years that I was a pastor that when I would talk with folks, especially when they would gone through difficult times in their lives and they were looking for ways that their faith as a Christian could anchor their life, uh, give them a place to stand and orient them to go keep on going and to go forward, uh, what they would draw from would be a hymn, Amazing Grace. What a friend we have in Jesus. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. And now uh, more contemporary songs that have been introduced in the life of the church, but that we absorb into our being uh, and that they form our lives and orient them to God and that we recall them often unconsciously at times in our life when we need them most. I think that hymns that speak to the Christian faith and tradition that are well-written, that are accessible to the congregation, uh, that really emphasize or reinforce God's majesty, uh, His holiness, God the Father, God the Son, the Holy Spirit, uh, God in so many different forms and ways speak uh, to us in, in, in ways that, as I said, uh, before really form us to be the Christians that we need to be. As the use of hymns and musical instruments grew and expanded in the 19th and 20th centuries, some Christian denominations remained true to their traditions of a cappella singing or chanting and prohibited the use of some or all instruments in worship. These include the Eastern Orthodox Church, Anabaptist churches including Amish and Mennonite, and Protestant denominations such as Primitive Baptists, churches of Christ, and others that followed a teaching of the Puritans called the regulative principle. Puritans were deeply concerned about grounding worship in Scripture, and they are known for what is often called the regulative principle. It might be translated more, most broadly as simply the, the conviction that Scripture regulates worship, but it's usually understood by its a more narrow articulation that only those things that are explicitly warranted in Scripture should be practiced in worship. So if something was not explicitly warranted in the biblical text, it should not be practiced. Puritans used this principle to rule out, for example, the use of candles in worship and many other expressions of ceremonial that they found uh, in Anglican practice to go beyond the explicit uh, mandates of Scripture itself. While some Christians upheld the teachings of the regulative principle in regard to worship, other Christians, particularly those in the charismatic movement of the mid to late 20th century, took the idea of personal expression in worship to a whole new level, one that involved using spiritual songs and hymns, stringed instruments and drums, and bodily expression in praise and adoration. The charismatics um, have 
mm-hmm. modeled for us, pioneered for us, and established in many places a pattern of opening worship with up to half an hour of uh, hymn singing or praise songs. They, uh, they have a kind of body language which you learn. You uh, raise your hands or um, do other things with your hands and the actions themselves signify your attitude. Adoration, need, dependence, and uh, how does one how does one say it? Um, openness, I suppose, to the great grace of God. Never limit what God and His love will give to His children. And I think that these features of worship have come to stay. As new styles and voices of modern worship have entered the life of the church, this revolution has led to what some people call the worship wars and the debate over contemporary versus traditional worship. I think there's a place for both traditional and contemporary worship as long as we remember to ask questions that take us uh, to more, a more substantial depth. In my mind, we really should not be mesmerized by the adjectives that we put in front of the word worship. That really what we need to be committed to is Christian worship and asking what it is that makes worship Christian and what is it that makes worship worship. The type of music, the style of music over 2,000 uh, years of the history of the church has changed and will continue to change. But what kind of music we sing, how we sing it, that depends on cultures, periods, and history. But the role of the music will stay the same underneath the style. Many folks ask me about the issue of traditional versus contemporary worship. Uh, And it's very obvious if you visit a variety of churches, you'll find where a congregation has decided that they're committed to one type or another. Now, I think often that tends to uh, be because we think worship is a style. And if worship is the praise of God and expressing our love and our gratitude to God, uh, it doesn't have to be a matter of style. And traditional worship uh, is essentially learning from the wisdom of the past and then living into that wisdom in fresh ways for today. And so true worship of God will always be traditional and contemporary. It'll live out of the past and it'll be fresh and new and truly relevant, as we like to say, for who we are in the particular place and time. Some worship leaders are seeking ways to blend contemporary and traditional worship styles in a way that incorporates each in a meaningful way into the worship service. Others are using globalization as a tool to introduce different worship styles to their congregations. We are seeing now in terms of worship resources um, an abundance uh, and more and more uh, global uh, praise songs, songs from Tizay, um, the Iona community, uh, thick songs from South Africa, and, and, and so many more. Uh, and that's great. In opposite corners of the world, two very different singer-songwriters are touching lives through their music. Darlene Cech is an internationally known worship leader who has performed around the world before millions as the recognizable voice and face of Australia's Hillsong music. She describes what draws us to worship. Out of a revelation of who God is, out comes this, this created need in us to worship, worship our Father in many different ways. You know, many times in song, Um, Very biblical to worship in song, even in the Psalms alone, over 40 times we're asked to sing. You know, I don't know why sing. I don't know why I didn't say dance or do a jig, but he said sing. Um, And it's a very powerful thing when you start to lift your voice and, and declare his greatness into the atmosphere. There is nothing like it. The music that has shaped a modern generation of worshipers is rooted in the scriptures and inspired by the awe of encountering God in everyday life and situations. Well, personally, I mean, I, I draw on two things mainly. I mean, of course, the Word of God and then experience. 
So whether it's either telling a story of something that I'm observing an experience or an experience with God, you know, if I open up the word and start to play, I mean, it speaks, it's alive. And so that itself, you can, there's so many songs to be written. The music of Darlene Check and Hillsong resonates with Christians around the world who are seeking a powerful and intimate worship experience with God. I look at the music that God is using around the earth and there are some common denominators. You know, I'm an observer. I like to kind of look underneath what's going on on the top. Um, but I would say that the songs are, they're prayers and they're very close prayers. It's like, you know, in that song, Save Your King, there's a moment when we sing, we love you, Lord. And a lot of people find that easy to sing, we worship you. But then there's a moment that we say, I love you, Lord, and I worship you. And people find that harder to sing than we, because it brings it close. For Darlene Check, worship is as much a part of life as music. It is a gift and a call to a greater purpose and power. Seasons change call of God in Romans, it says it's, it's irrevocable. His gifts and talents are given without repentance. It's, it's in there, but seasons change. So there's times when you will have more time to devote to one thing than another, or a time where God will say, come away, get, get out of that light, come into my light, just let me fuel you. That's what changes, but not his call. This call, as Czech describes it, extends to every aspect of daily life. I don't have a time where I worship and then a time where I am a mother and a time where I'm, I am a worshiper. I am a mother. I am a daughter of God. I am um, a bringer of change. I am these things. And so every part of my life has got to represent that. Across the globe, in a community church in Nashville, Tennessee, record producer and singer-songwriter Jason Hauser was teaching a week-long youth Bible school when he experienced a life-changing worship experience. Through the course of that week, uh, I taught the scriptures, and on a Friday I stood on the stage in the barn, and I'm playing through the songs, and one of the verses was 1 Timothy 4.12. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech and life in love and faith and purity. I remember just standing up in the barn singing that song and just watching every kid and every teacher just sing the verses word for word. Out of that experience in the barn grew a ministry called Seeds Family Worship that teaches the scripture to children and parents through contemporary worship music. To have families together during that praise time where the kids can see their parents singing to God, where they can see their parents taking communion, where they can be a part of the worship service and really talk about what these things mean. But it's very meaningful to see that. And the greatest influence uh, on a child's life is going to be their parent. And so to have that time, the way you draw a kid in is to be an example. As an adult, you show them, here's how we praise God. It's exciting, you know. Hauser believes there is a strong connection between the power of music and scripture in teaching the truth of God's word to young people as well as adults. The thing that's been so exciting for us is music builds an affection for the scripture because it helps the kids take it in. And so it, it really is a connecting point. And for all of us, music helps us to memorize. I mean, it's the bottom line. You know, there are scriptures that are hard to remember one of my favorite scriptures is Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am convinced neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any power, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. That's always a scripture that I wanted to memorize, but just like pieces of the puzzle, I had all the pieces there, but I didn't have them in the, the right place. But then when we put a melody to that scripture, then I'm able to just say that and it's just a part of who I am. One of the most rewarding aspects of the ministry for Hauser is seeing the joy and enthusiasm of children as they learn the worship songs. It's fun to connect with kids. I always have kids that come up and actually lead worship with me uh, every night. And 
And then I have kids that are discovering songs and they're singing the songs and maybe they've been singing them in their van or at home, but they kind of make the connection that the songs were all in the Bible because all the seed songs are word for word scripture. And, and the, but a kid will inevitably come up to me and say, Mr. Jason, your songs are in the Bible. And they're so excited that they've discovered that yes. And I was like, well, yeah, they, they are actually, the Bible came first and we're doing this, you know, but it's fun to see the, the lights come on for them and to realize, wow, we're, we're learning the Bible in your songs. Seed's family worship has changed lives as Jason can attest. One of the stories that just has had such a profound impact on me was a church in Dallas, Texas. Uh, every time I, I lead a family event, I always have young kids come up and sing with me you know, usually ages from maybe six to 15, and they come and actually lead worship. They're a part of the praise time and they lead for the whole time and use their gifts for God. And we had a young girl and she was about eight years old and um, she did such a great job and she just was a light and she was beaming. And her mom came up to me after and she just said, I wanna share a story with you. She said, one of the songs that, that you guys sang tonight, the song, Take Heart, and the song, uh, the, the scripture is, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. For in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. That's the scripture. And so she said when, when we were practicing, she said my little girl was in her room and we were cleaning her room. We had her CD, CD on and we were singing this song. And she said, I've recently just gone through a really difficult divorce and this has been such a challenging time for her because um, her dad really just left us and abandoned us. And and this has meant so much for her to be a part of this night. But she, as we were practicing, she just looked at me. She said, Mom, this is our song. And, and uh, as she was telling me that, I just knew that that girl was encouraged. And, and the joy that was in that little girl as we did that night, and then for her to share that story with me, it's the power of God's Word. And, and that is her song, because God, is, God has overcome the world. And uh, that just was, meant, meant the world to me, to be able to be used by God to be a small part of that. Music reaches into our hearts and, and connects with us in a very powerful way, and that is God-ordained. Music is, indeed, powerful and God-ordained. Whether it is the words of the Psalms chanted in a unison voice, the organ accompaniment of a solemn mass, the comforting words of a beloved hymn, the sea of hands uplifted to a contemporary praise song, or favorite verses of scripture sung by a children's choir, it is certain that God inhabits the praises of His people. The style may change, but the underlying song of God and His love sings on for all eternity.